I'm delighted to be here today. I'm delighted to be here at uh, this event organised by the IBI and thank the Chair, uh, John Purcell, for inviting me here to speak to you at the second Radio Days conference. Uh, I was talking to John earlier on. Uh, the last time I addressed the members was uh, in Monksland in County Roscommon, uh, which will remain in Monksland in County Roscommon for those of you that have any interest in geography. Um, and there was a lot of doom and gloom at the time. Look, people have heard from communications ministers before that have promised the sun, moon and stars, uh, but nothing ha has ever progressed. And I wanted to change that. I wanted to change that because I suppose I remember the very first broadcast that Anne Norris made on Shannon Side Radio uh, when it went live for the first time. I was in school at the time, which Anne Norris doesn't like being reminded of. Uh, but uh, it's something and it's a medium that I've always loved. Uh, and I think it's a really, really powerful medium. Uh, and it's something that we as Irish people uh, are innately proud of and we use on, on a daily basis. Uh, and like, you know, the statistics are phenomenal. 83% of Irish people listen to radio every day. That's four out of five adults in this country listen to radio every day. I don't think there's anywhere in the world uh, that you have that uh, type of a receptive audience, particularly in, in a connected uh, society like we have in Ireland and is getting more connected on a daily basis, I might remind you as well. So like radio has a very special place uh, in Ireland. And I think, you know, the work that's been done with uh, Learning Wave Skillnet, uh, the IBI, and they've been supported here in relation to this initiative by uh, Michael O'Keefe and the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, uh, Skillnets and EMRO. Uh, and I think their support is very much appreciated uh, in relation to it. But it is a very, very powerful medium. Uh, and I want to congratulate each and every one of you for the work and commitment and effort that you're putting into that. Look, I'm very conscious of this. I'm a rural TD. I know the importance of the public service aspect uh, of local radio. And if anyone was ever in any doubt in relation to that, all we have to do is go back to Storm Ophelia, you know? And uh, I was talking to uh, a number of people that were involved uh, in Storm Ophelia and the one mistake that we made, and I'll put it out to everyone here now, is to encourage people, if there's a red alert or a storm coming, to buy batteries for your radio. People don't think about it. You know, it's something, when I was growing up, uh, you know, you had electricity blackouts every now and again. Everyone had batteries, everyone had candles. Uh, but my own children have never seen an electricity blackout. You know, and it's not something that we're conscious of. But the local radio was the only vehicle and, uh, and, and method to actually get the communication out there. So it does provide a very, very important uh, avenue for people to get public service information. Uh, and I think, you know, the commercial and community radio stations provide a vital service uh, in relation to communities right uh, across uh, this country. And I know from um, going home and talking to my own mother, She's able to tell me more about what I did during the day than I can even remember myself. And she hasn't left the house from listening to the local radio and hearing what's going on. So I think, you know, as we celebrate the contribution to our country here today that radio has provided, I am very, very conscious of the backdrop in relation to the growing concerns uh, that are there across the industry, uh, trying to grapple with the coming of age of uh, digital content and the, the digital media platforms. The providers want to deliver information in an age of news-hungry people who are impressed by volume, the ease, and the speed of online content, information, and entertainment. But no industry has ever simply arrived. It has developed over a period of time. The one prediction I will give you, though, is uh, that the rate of change today is slower than it will ever be uh, in the future. Having said that, the service that the IBI member stations deliver to listeners has never been more important. With advertising revenues stagnant or reducing for the, all of the traditional media, and while the digital media's advertising soars, the most important question for me as Minister is how do we ensure the supply of local content that is reliable and is relevant to local audiences? 
Earlier on today, and I jested there that I, I was here in the RDS, but earlier on I was in the RDS, where we had the Green Schools uh, Climate Expo. Uh, and one of the schools I met there was St. Brendan's National School, who had a display from Blennerville in, outside Tralee. And their project was trying to reduce the amount of plastic uh, in our oceans. And they found that they weren't actually getting their message across. So they wrote their own song. Uh, and they uh, gave me a rendition of the song uh, earlier on, but they went a step further. They went to Kerry Radio. They convinced Kerry Radio to allow them to put an ad on the radio, and they broadcast that ad. Because they themselves realised that they wanted to get the message out. The way to do that was through their local radio. And I think, you know, all credit is due to Kerry Radio for taking that and supporting uh, Blennerville National School uh, in taking that initiative. But it just shows you that connection between young people today who are very digitally savvy. They went to the local radio station, but also the local radio station grasped that opportunity. I think Kerry Radio is to be congratulated in relation to that. My own view is that the most efficient way to achieve reliable and relevant content uh, is to support the traditional and respected media organisations that we have already operating in this area. All of us as politicians and citizens expect a fair hearing uh, on issues that matter to us. And in an age where fake news can often inform public debate as much as hard facts, audience demand and deserve trusted uh, sources of information with balanced, evidence-based comment and opinion. The content that you produce provides that. Despite the challenges you face, we expect our broadcasters to provide high quality programming that reflects our common experience and provides an Irish perspective, or more importantly, a local perspective on events and current affairs. I remember back uh, a number of years ago, Seamus Brennan, Lord Reston, was the Minister for Transport at the time. And Pat Kinney was with a, another radio station uh, at the time. But um, we had the, the Care Viaduct accident. Uh, and I thought it was a massive story because an hour before the, the freight train uh, collapsed into the Care Viaduct, when the viaduct collapsed, uh, a passenger train had travelled from Limerick to Waterford. And it was a big issue. But the story on the 9 o'clock news that night, the top story, was the delay in the dart in Dublin because we had very heavy rain. Uh, so, you know, it is important that we have a local perspective on things uh, and we don't just take for granted that an Irish story is relevant to everyone across this country. Because of these challenges, last year I asked the Joint Directors Committee to look at the future funding of public service broadcasting, and more importantly, cons to consider the wider questions such as whether our current definition of public service media will be fit for purpose in the next five to ten years. Also, as an interim measure, when I was appointed as Minister, I focused on the steps which I could take in the short term, which would put broadcasters on a more stable financial footing. I received government approval for the drafting of a number of proposed amendments to the current Broadcasting Act of 2009, which included changes to the broadcasting levy. This amendment will help to alleviate the, the levy burden on independent broadcasters by up to 50%. I'm proud to say that I'm the first communications minister to move on reducing this burden, and I know the burden that that levy imposes on each and every one of you. I've also secured government approval for the creation of a new funding scheme that would provide bursaries to young journalists working in local and community radio stations who produce content with real public service value. These legislative proposals are currently undergoing pre-legislative scrutiny, and have been doing so since May of last year. I've been assured by the committee uh, that this stage will be finalised next week, so the detailed drafting can commence immediately to ensure the swift passage uh, through the Oireachtas uh, of this legislation. It is my goal to have this enacted by the summer. It was my goal to have it enacted by the end of last year. But once I get it back from the committee, it will be full steam ahead uh, and I will uh, try and get this through as quickly as possible because I know how imperative it is. Since bringing forward those proposals, I've spoken to many of you and I understand the pressures that you face, particularly in respect of, of advertising revenues. 
and conscious of the need for caution when proposing that government would interfere within the advertising market, but I feel that some of the restrictions faced by the commercial radio stations are outdated and are in need of reform. As a result, I am today announcing my intention to seek Cabinet approval to amend Section 41, subsection 2 of the Broadcasting Act of 2009 to remove the hourly limit on advertising for commercial radio stations. And that's going to facilitate Sean Wadge uh, with his historic broadcast on Galway Bay FM uh, from Crow Park uh, last September when Galway won the All-Ireland and it was some very memorable broadcast or the broadcast by Willie Hegarty on Shannon Side Radio back in 2006 when Riscam and Miners won uh, the All-Ireland final, when Willie Hegarty broadcast the All-Ireland replay from Cusick Park when I thought he was going to swallow the microphone rather than speak into it. Uh, but I think, you know, they are innately Irish. You know, whether it's the local uh, clubs playing hurling or football, whether it's the, the soccer matches that are being broadcast, you know, I think sport is something that we are, are very, very proud of. No more than radio, it's very much part of what makes us Irish. And I think we need to facilitate that and provide the flexibility uh, in the broadcasting and advertising revenue to facilitate that. I'll be seeking cabinet approval to make these amendments at committee stage of the broadcasting amendment bill once the Joint Directors Committee has concluded its pre-legislative scrutiny. For clarity, Flexibility in respect of television minutage will be considered further during the implementation of the revisions of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. Once again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak to you here today. I look forward to working with you further in the future. And I can give you my commitment to try and support in a very practical way everything I can do to try and support radio, support uh, the broadcasting sector, because it is innately Irish. It is something that we are very proud of. And I think, you know, to our international visitors uh, here, you're all uh, very welcome. Uh, but it is something that we are very proud of here in Ireland. It's something that we want to not only see maintained, but enhanced and developed through the digital era. And we are very much, much uh, you know, uh, a lighthouse in this uh, digital soup that we have now that radio has come through and I believe will con continue to come through in the future. Gormila Mahagod.